Welcome back as we take a look at our Old Testament reading for this past Sunday. Jeremiah 23, 1 to 6. And this becomes one of those Old Testament um, passages which points to its fulfillment in Christ, where Jesus looked upon the crowds and saw them as this, this great crowd, a sheep without a shepherd. And as we listen to this, Jeremiah's words become important as the Old Testament context for our New Testament readings. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, again, open our ears so that we learn to hear and encounter Christ, not merely in our, our, our New Testament kind of a world where we, we read the New Testament without that connection to the Old, but um, with a deeper understanding built upon all of the promises that you've proclaimed through those thousands of years prior to Christ through the prophets. Bless us as we dig into the words from Jeremiah. All this we pray for in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. All right. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. For Jeremiah, those words are, are harsh words, and we need to hear them in our world today. There is one thing to be a strong preacher of the gospel and a strong preacher of the law, but there's often times where we become so heavy in the way that we preach or within the character of our personality that we scatter the sheep. And there is a harsh word of warning for us here as we take a look and as listen, as we listen as pastors under the new covenant as well. We are not called to scatter God's sheep. Um, we're called to preach, well, repentance and forgiveness, law and gospel, these kinds of things so that we tell of Christ who has died, who has risen, who will come again, so that as we build upon that and preach that message by which the Holy Spirit gathers people to eternity through Jesus, through that flesh of Christ, the way we heard yesterday, we have this reminder here that our job is not to go and come in with such a heavy hand that we scatter the sheep. We, we're called to mend bruised reeds, the way that Jesus explains that in the Gospels. But here, in the Old Testament context, you know, as the word of the Lord came through Jeremiah, he was speaking words of judgment. Scatter the sheep. And how do we scatter the sheep? Not only through being heavy-handed, but then also by chasing them to follow all kinds of false forms of worship, which was happening throughout, well, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament during this time. <sighs> Let's worship the Lord. Keep the first commandment, you know, the creeds, that expression of Jesus Christ right from the scriptures, first and foremost in the front, rather than chasing after, you know, well, Jesus is one of many ways, the way that people like to say today. It's, the scriptures never say that. Never say that. And so rather than teaching people to follow false voices, let's preach Christ in the first commandment to worship the Lord our God and serve him only. So, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Comes as a warning from God himself. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Okay. What do we do with that? And as we hear that. You know, it's one of those elements that's we hear it, um, it becomes this important reflection for us in our own ministries here today as pastors. And you have not attended to them, it becomes a harsh word. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. And again, you know, there is that word of judgment. This is why in the New Testament, it, you know, when James talks about um, becoming a preacher, we should not claim to be teachers. Teacher is the word un underneath um, how rabbi was translated into, into um, the Greek language. We shouldn't take on the role of teacher lightly because, you know, there is that greater judgment upon us if we are careless within our work. Then the Lord says, I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. Now notice, here's the shift, though. Where? And it's not to take a look at, you know, pastors under the new covenant um, and say, see, we don't have any responsibility. No, that's not at all what these words are saying. But looking from the Old Testament context, the Lord here is promising, saying underneath the Old Testament context where these, the people who were supposed to be shepherding, the, the, the pastors, the priests who were supposed to be shepherding the people became faithless. Okay, They became harsh. They became um, inattentive. What ended up happening is, is that the Lord says, I'm going to step in. 
Okay, and this is, again, pointing to Christ, who by his incarnation becomes that new shepherd, the good shepherd, where he says and takes the words of the Lord's Prayer, where it says, Yahweh is my shepherd, the Lord, and turns Yahweh, which means he who is, he is my shepherd, into I am the good shepherd, putting it in the first person voice, the same way that God spoke from, from the burning bush, I am who I am. And then that becomes one of those, one of those glaring um, gospel connections right there in the book of John, where John is clearly articulating that Jesus is saying that he is the Lord Yahweh in the flesh. Um, sorry to our, our Jehovah Witness people and then to Muslim people who would like to say Jesus never claimed that. No, he does. He does. Through, and then the Gospels are, are absolutely full of this. If only we take a look and we read it in the original. That's there. That's there. So here again, I will gather the remnant of my flock. So the Lord will do the gathering out of all the countries where I have driven them, Okay, recognizing that in the Old Testament context, the Lord had driven and scattered the people into all the nations of the world. He says, I'm going to gather them together. Okay, And I will bring them back to the fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. So that under this new covenant, under Christ our Lord, there will be new fruits of righteousness, good works that will flow. Don't ever think that by talking about grace that we don't talk about works of righteousness. The two go hand in glove. Okay. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. And so, again, here as we talk about how the Lord, fulfilled in Christ, will come to be that new shepherd, Christ will establish a new, well, we could call it a new priesthood, okay, a pastorate. Okay, where the word priest actually comes out as, as a, the way that it came into the English language is not so much a reference and a reflection of the Old Testament priests, a sacrificial priesthood, but instead um, is, is a reflection of the, the Greek word underneath that Jesus uses and is used throughout the New Testament to refer to the clergy as presbyters, presbyters being the old men, okay, the old guys, um, the old men, where presbyter got shortened to prebst and prest and then eventually priest with a vowel change, you know, that's all Oxford English Dictionary history history of the English language. So as we listen to all of this, you know, here, as we talk about this new kind of a clergy, a new kind of shepherds, new kind of priesthood, if we want to use that term, where God says, okay, and this, he's going to be the shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd, and he establishes a new pastorate. This is what the New Testament pastorate is supposed to be where we do the gathering work, where we do the proclaiming work, where we preach repentance and forgiveness. And so the Lord says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Okay, what's this about? Hmm. Okay, well, here's the thing. David, as the Old Testament covenants and promises were sharpened a little bit more, first of all, Garden of Eden, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Then we take a look at Noah and the ark that God will never destroy the earth in a flood like this ever again. And baptism becomes, as we read in the New Testament, this, this antitype, this Old Testament inverse image of, 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 of baptism, where, where instead of the ones touched by water being destroyed, the people touched by water are being saved. That's what Peter is saying, as he says that this, this, this now symbolizes baptism as he talks about the ark. He doesn't say baptism is, sim is a symbol. He says the Old Testament is an antitype, is the the word underneath of baptism which now saves you okay as we hear this you know as we go along as we go along and as we move through this here it gets focused a little bit more at well mount sinai as the ten commandments are given you are my god nor i am your god you are my people and then finally well i shouldn't say finally when we get to david god makes it even a little bit more sharper and says, through your line, I will establish a king who will be king forever. Okay, so all of these promises of a savior, okay, the one through whom all nations of the world will be blessed to Abraham. Well, comes through David's family line. And this is where we go. I will raise up for you, da uh, for David, okay, so the promise made to David, a righteous branch, a new shoot, okay, because... Well, the Davidic line of the family of David, well, had fallen apart, had crumbled. Okay, the nations had overtaken Israel, and, well, you know, the whole question is, is do you have David's family line anymore that you can point to and say, this is going to be the king? But, 
from David's family line, and this is where the genealogies at the beginning of the Gospels are important because they point out that Mary is a descendant of David, a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. What kind of a king? Well, we're reminded before Pilate, not of this world. Okay, Not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. But he will execute justice and righteousness in the land. Okay. In his days, Judah will be saved. Okay. How? Well, we know from the scriptures. By his death on the cross, by his stripes, we are healed. And Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And notice how that is expressed. <clears throat> Same way as we hear it in the book of Revelation. Who is our righteousness? Is it all the good works that we've done? The answer is no, it's the Lord. In the same way as we hear those hymns in heaven as, as the Lord opens the door for um, John to peer into heaven and he hears these songs, you know, saying, you are the one who has done all of these righteous things. You are the one who has slain for us. You have redeemed us. You have done all of these things. And it's the Lord who is our righteousness, which, you know, as we hear that, <coughs> becomes that important um, realization, and again, and that's always there, Old and New Testament, that the righteousness by which we get into heaven is not our own. It's the righteousness of God in Christ, which we get to be clothed in in baptism, which we get to be washed in as we're washed in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which we, through which we die with Christ and are raised with him. So that even when we lean on our, on our baptism, it's not looking at baptism as a work that I've done the way that far too many within the evangelical world have flipped it around from what Scripture says. It's not our work. It's a work of Christ where he says, this is what you receive in baptism, the gift of forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that baptism becomes and catches us and becomes alive within our lives as well. As we listen to this, as we properly lean on our baptism it is an extension and an expression and a work of christ that we build upon so that it's not our own righteousness that we tout before the lord but instead it is another work of his by which he has claimed us and made us his own and we can point to that saying but the lord is our righteousness the lord is my righteousness and on that i have hope and on that i can build in faith as we hear this, you know, that's the kind of faith that we're talking about as it relates to baptism, both in the way in the New Testament writes and the way in which Luther writes. But at the same time, you know, it becomes also far deeper because rather than viewing these things, viewing God as so far distant and unrelated, we see that he continues to be busy and active, not only not only the way that so many people will say through the Holy Spirit, and then they'll try and guess what the Holy Spirit is doing. No, in his word, that the death and resurrection of Jesus have an eternal significance that we're joined into, so that as the Holy Spirit does work, and we do have scripture telling us this, we learn to confess our sins as this constant motion, emptying ourselves of our brokenness in order to be filled more and more by that gift of our Lord's righteousness and faith, so that we grow up in him like, well, branches grafted to a vine so that, well, his righteousness becomes the very lifeblood that feeds us so that we grow by his strength. As we hear these words, you know, ties together with so many elements within our teaching that we so often, you know, don't allow ourselves to coordinate. Um, and yet at the same time, it's all tied together. May the Lord bless us so that as we dig into the scriptures, you know, old and new, that we learn to see the full and the depth of the, the the full depth and beauty of what it is that our Lord calls us to and has called us to, so that we would learn not only to to lean more deeply into that, but then also to become the way that Paul writes, participants, partakers of the, that beautiful goodness in everything that we do throughout our lives. All this, you know, and I pray for you in the name of Jesus, and we say, Amen.